It is a universal truth that you reap what you sow. This therefore suggests that the nature, size and quality of any harvest depends on the type and quality of seed sown. Along with soil type and other abiotic factors, seeds are the single most important component in crop farming. The program is transforming agriculture in Nigeria. Welcome to this edition. On tonight's episode, we will highlight the importance of seed, the challenges encountered when a farmer gets it wrong with seeds, and what the ministry and other stakeholders are doing to ensure farmers get a bumper harvest through the production of quality seeds. But first, we'll take a look at the ministry's diary of events in recent time. Stay with us. Welcome back. Our news diary contains interactions from the Ministry's budget defense exercise at the National Assembly. Also in the news, ICRISAT brief Ministry of Agric on outcomes of studies. If we close our borders with regard to milk and fish, we'll the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Mohamed Sabu Nanono, has reiterated the need for government to place a ban on the importation of milk and fish into the country to fast-track the nation's quest for self-dependence on the products. Nanono was responding to questions during the budget defense exercise before the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development. He noted that Nigeria has the capacity to do with milk and fish what she did with rice. Take the issue of milk production and also take the issue of fish. Why should we import fish? Know this dirty, frozen fish that we are bringing into this country. What? If we close our borders and regard to milk and fish, well, we are not going to die. In fact, we are going to get a better milk and a better fish. Nigeria has a resource base to close doors for fish. With regard to milk, all attention is on cattle. We have 25 million cattle. 5 million cattle will, will give us 1, one liter per day. Our requirement per day for milk is 5 million liters per day. The, that's the issue is logistic. And the ministry is taking up this issue of logistics seriously by establishment of small scale milk processing centers. The minister added that private sector investment in milk production has also increased in recent time. He noted that the successful attainment of food and nutrition security through import substitution is crucial if the country is to shore up its revenue generation and better fund its sectors. Reacting, members of the committee said a lot has to be considered for such steps to be taken. One cow alone. In one milk session, could give maybe what 20, 30 of our cows will not give. So you need improved breeds. How we do that? You need our scientists. Total proposed budgetary allocation for the agricultural sector for 2021 stands at 179.3 billion naira, with 66 billion naira for personnel costs. 3.1 billion naira for overhead and 110.2 billion naira for capital expenditure. The figure represents 1.5% of the country's budget for 2021. A reality expert say falls short of the 10% Nigeria and other African nations agreed to set aside annually for agriculture. The International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, ICRISAT, has called for improved availability of seeds of improved varieties to farmers in the country, as well as enhanced linkages between research and policy makers. This was contained in the recommendations of a survey-based report of studies conducted on value chain analysis for sorghum, millet, and groundnut in Nigeria. The study presented recently at the ministry's headquarters in Abuja also recommended a clear genetic mapping 
and performance evaluation of all varieties in the hands of farmers and in the market and better information and access to improved seeds to farmers for increased adoption. If research conducts agric research for development in the dry savanna zones of northern Nigeria in collaboration with other national and international partners. In this venture, as the country rep has mentioned, they have carried out about seven surveys on the adoption, one, and impact of improved technologies of sorghum, pure millet, and granite in Nigeria. Secondly, they also had another survey on sorghum, pure millet, and granite and value chain analysis in the country. So they are here today, Honorable Minister, to debrief you and present the outcomes of their studies to stakeholders. In his response, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Mohamed Sabo Nanono, expressed concern over the non-standardization of some seeds for crops like sorghum, stressing the need for increased enlightenment of farmers. Sorghum is becoming an industrial crop, but unfortunately the, the seeds so far being planted in this country are not standardized. I, I remember I quote that between Kano and the Kano, you can get probably 30 varieties of sorghum, and that is not good enough. We have high yielding sorghum uh, 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 developed by INCRSA and also by Institute of Agricultural Research. Zaria and other research institutions, but this issue must be addressed. To standardize what we need is education and uh, 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 orientation. The program is transforming agriculture in Nigeria. Thanks for staying with us. While it is often possible to count the seeds in an orange, it is impossible to count the oranges in a seed. That is the mystery of seeds. And while this is true, science tells us that two seeds of a crop may not perform similarly due to differences in genetic makeup and physical traits. But what is being done to ensure that farmers get only the best seed? How is the ministry pursuing this mandate? What concrete steps have been taken in recent time to promote quality seedlings for agriculture? We'll find out in our next segment, Records of the FDA. The farm itself was established around 1983. Basically, it was meant to produce chickens and then you have the farmland uh, to produce the corn or the feeds for the, for the farm. And then it's been lying down fallow now. I came back uh, like four years ago and I decided, well, since we have the land, why not start or kick off something? It's been three years since he returned to revive the family farm. Of all the things he has learnt, one stands out. You have to have very, very good seed, which has been researched and developed well. As you mean now, you're into animal feeds. There's a particular corn that you grow because they need the protein and they need the other things from it. And if you're into maize flour production, now you need the corns that will probably give you the more uh, flour that you need. This 600 hectare farmland is located at the Duncan Day area of Kaduna State. For now, Kabir has, since his return, been trying his hands on crop farming and horticulture. The mango orchard, he says, has existed for almost two decades. He is now experimenting on cashew, guava, and even passion fruit, which he says has a huge fruit juice market. So it's not this is not even fully ripe. Because mm. if it's fully ripe it'll just be in a like a bit liquid form. Okay, interesting. One thing that ties all of these together is seed. Without the right seed, 
all other factors considered, everything can go wrong. At this maize farm, harvesting is still ongoing. As he reveals, pesticides have to be applied at least twice every farming cycle to safeguard the crops from insect damage. You have to spray on time. If you have to fertilize on time as well and then looking after the farm. Thankfully, he has become a part of an ongoing project to produce quality seeds that research institutions can work on in a bid to provide seeds that are not only early maturing but pest resistant as well. This kind of maize is different from other grains which we plant for consumption. It is through this maize we produce the ones we plant and sell at the market. It is also taken to the laboratory for tests after harvest. Selected as an outgrower, Kabir receives maize seeds from this association, along with other inputs and grows them on his farm strictly for research purposes. The association buys the entire harvest after they are shelled, a process which involves removing the grains from the cup and bag. I don't like the idea of importing seeds into the country or whatever type, except in some cases. But let me tell you, for the major crops, groundnut, sorghum, rice, millet, soya beans, take about seven, eight of them even tubers and other things like that. Our research centers can produce good seed. What they need is empowerment. And that's what we are trying to do. If you take Institute of Agricultural Research Samaru, they have mandate for maize, for soga, for beans. There are three major categories of seed. These are foundation seeds, breeder seeds, and certified seeds. While both foundation and breeder seeds are developed by research institutions, certified seeds represent the commercial sector, where registered companies receive duly approved foundation seeds from research institutions, multiply and commercialize them. With climate change and global warming threatening the universe, experts are re-emphasizing the need to produce seeds that are early maturing in a bid to avoid the adverse effects of the ever-changing weather by empowering research institutions and partnering with international organizations the ministry is constantly working out ways to help farmers stay ahead All over the nation, there are farmers like Kabir Wushishi looking for ways to cut down on production losses and reduce costs as well. But what if they can get seeds whose crops will be resistant to pests and insects, leading to high yield and almost 100% harvest? Well, your guess is as good as mine. That will mean a bumper harvest for the farmer, increased income, improved livelihood and more revenues for the nation. In our next segment, Partnership for Development, we'll see some strides being recorded by one institute whose overall mandate is centered on seeds improvement. Stay with us. We will try to avoid any chemical form of fertilizer or anything. So from this day, here, that is what we I hope you are following the normal procedure of feeding. We have been fascinated seeing the taste moving. Major insects have been identified to pose devastating consequences for some major crops in Nigeria, including maize and cowpea. The pod borer known as Maruka vitrata and stem borers like Busiola fusca and Sesamia calamistis. In fact, it is said that the pod borer which affects the pods of cowpea can lead to almost 90% loss.
There is the issue of increased production cost as a result of repeated application of insecticides. On the other hand, such application can leave chemical residues that render the crops unsuitable for export. A good example is the Nigerian brown cow pea, which the European Union has placed an import ban on. One institution that took up the challenge is the Institute for Agricultural Research, Zaria. You are referring to the residual effects of chemicals that have been used in producing the cow pea and also in some instances those that are used in storage. The underlying problem there is uh, first our farmers use excessive chemicals much outside that which is recommended to them by our extension agents. That is one cause. Secondly, we are using varieties maybe that demand so much spray of insecticide on and on and on before they are produced. Now, an answer to this problem is that one, the new cowpea variety I alluded to you, instead of up to eight sprays of insecticide, it will do very well with only two sprays of insecticide. To do this, the Institute has taken very practical measures to develop pest resistant varieties. When we want to develop vari um, varieties, some t for disease resistance, for example, we rely on nature to provide the disease material and then it will infect the material we are working in before we make our selections. But sometimes the pressure of the disease may not be as high as required by science. We don't want to uh, be, have misjudgment about the resistance. So we rear the disease in the laboratory and add to the plant in the field so that quickly it is clobbered. Anything that is not resistant will not stand it. And anything that you see that resists that thing is truly resistant. The Insect Rearing Laboratory at the Crop Protection Unit of the Institute focuses on the two major organisms, the pod borer and the stem borer. The first insect we rear is the Maruka pod borer. It means it pull, it bores the pod of a beans or cowpea, eat of the developing grains, damage the flowers, wave the leaves. So that pest cause up to 80% yield loss if you don't control. That is the first insect that we rear here in this lab. Then we have other insects such as the stem borers. What do you mean by stem? They bore the stem of a maize sorghum plant and kill it off. That plant cannot be able to bear grains. The process begins with preparing an environment that is conducive for the insects. You have to have regulated temperature and relative humidity for the insect to survive. Then we collect larvae from the field. Then we, we drop them on what we call artificial diet. Diet that has been constituted that the insect will feed. Once the insect feed on that diet, it will develop to what we call pupa. And these are the pupa. And then this pupa takes for um, seven days to emerge. After emergence, we take them to the cages here. This is an uh, oviposition room. One important part of the process is identifying the male and female adults once they mature and putting both sexes in a controlled environment for mating and egg collection. They have been laying eggs. You see some drops of eggs on the wall. These are the eggs. This is the stem borer. No, this is Maruka. This is Maruka. Yeah, this is stem borer. Stem borer has... It is Maruka that requires this temperature. Yeah. This even, even the other ones require, but this one requires more of this temperature mm -hmm. because we have to artificially humidify the room. This is what we call humidifier. Mm -hmm. This produces some high humidity. Without that humidity, they cannot be able to mate and lay eggs. This process is repeated until thousands of lava are produced. These are then taken to the field to artificially infest the plants. This uh, leaf shattering and damage you saw. A visit to the maize experimentation yeah. farm, where regular maize seeds have been planted side by side, genetically modified organisms GMO maize plants, shows the level of resistance. 
with advent of advanced breeding research and biotechnology, it has demonstrated that we could have those varieties of maize that don't require any spraying with pesticides to control fall armyworm or stem borers. This we are demonstrating under the combined field trial. This field now has some entries of hybrids of maize that are genetically modified using conventional biotechnology to resist fall armyworm and stem borers. Now what a story that was, and quite revealing too. And just in case you were concerned about the safety of those particular modified varieties of maize and cowpea, they have been tested clinically and deemed safe for both human and animal consumption. What is needed is more enlightenment for farmers to accept what is undoubtedly a better option for the next planting season. Thankfully, there is one farmer who is already cultivating some of these new varieties. Find out who he is in our next segment, Farmers Speak. Before now, when plant local seed, it takes four months to grow and mature for harvest. But with the introduction of this cowpea seed by the Institute of Agricultural Research as well as the education received, we now harvest in less than three months. There is also ease of spray, all like the local seed that we have to spray about seven times before harvest. This one is different, as you can see. I spray only three times before harvesting. Cowpea, also known as black-eyed pea, belongs to the family of legumes known as beans. It is a popular leguminous grain that serves as food for both humans and animals. As a crop, it is grown in the semi-arid tropics of Africa, Europe, Asia, Central and South America, and the United States. It is a drought-tolerant plant and performs well in different types of soil. Cowpea is an important agricultural commodity among farmers in developing countries due to its adaptability, resistance to drought and erosion, as well as its ability to improve soil fertility when the roots are left to decay. The young leaves, immature pods, immature seeds and mature dried seeds are eaten in whole by humans, while the stem vines and leaves serves as feed for animals. It can be cooked and eaten as beans meal, processed and eaten as bean cake, locally known as akara, or as beans pardon, also called moi moi locally. As at 2018, global production of cowpea was 7.4 million tons, with more than 90% 7.1 million tons produced in Africa. Nigeria is currently the world's largest producer of cowpea, accounting for almost half of the entire global production. As at 2018, the country produced about 3 million tons. A metric ton of cowpea sells for between $1,100 and $1,300. We truly cannot do agriculture successfully without science. Attempting to do so will only see us moving in circles. Once we get the seedlings right and ensure our farmers are better able to deal with biotic factors like pests and diseases, and some abiotic factors as well, such as drought, most of their challenges would have been solved, and the country will be better for it. I'll be back again next week as we continue this journey towards agricultural transformation in Nigeria. Do stay safe and bye for now. <laughs>